This video has been sponsored by Squarespace, an all-in-one website platform for anyone trying to succeed online. Chromatography, a useful technique in every chemist's handbook. We all see chemists do it, but what's the science behind it? I think we first have to ask, well, what is chromatography? Let's explain this in a simple way. Let's say that I have two different compounds. We will label this compound A and compound B. Let's say I want to know what compound A or compound B is. Well, I can't analyze them if they're in a mixture. So, I'm going to have to separate them. And that's where chromatography comes in. Now, there are a lot of chromatography techniques, but we're going to go through the main ones. And we're going to start with thin layer chromatography, or also called TLC. For this technique, they use aluminum or glass back plates that have silica gel on them. Now, silica gel consists of a three-dimensional network of thousands of alternating silicon and oxygen bonds with OH groups on the outside surface. Basically, what this means is that silica gel is highly polar and capable of hydrogen bonding. Now, what this allows us to do is separate compounds based on their polarity. Now, TLC functions on the same principle as all chromatography, However, there's a couple differences. It's mainly used as an analytical technique to basically determine the number of components in a mixture, identify the compound, or the purity of a compound. This is actually a really good technique because it's simple, relatively low cost, high sensitivity, and it has good speed of separation. Now this is a mock-up drawing of a TLC plate. The big white line on the bottom of the TLC plate is called the start line or the deposit line. This is where you dissolve your sample and dot it on there. The two big red dots are different compounds with different polarities. Now there are two different phases in thin layer chromatography, and that's one, the mobile phase, and two, the stationary phase. The stationary phase is simply the phase that doesn't move, which can be either a liquid or a solid that's attached to your surface. Now there are many different stationary phases that's used in different applications. And it's really up to you to decide what stationary phase you need depending on the application or compound that you're using to separate. For example, silica gel is acidic, so it doesn't really work well with basic compounds and it won't separate correctly. Now, the mobile phase is a solvent that will travel up the plate. And the mobile phase can be pretty annoying since you kind of have to do trial and error to get the best mobile phase. Generally, a good starting solvent is a one-to-one -one ratio of hexane and ethyl acetate. Now, when the mobile phase travels up the plate, it takes the compounds with it. Since silica gel is polar, the more polar compounds will stay behind as the more non-polar ones will progress forward. This is because polar compounds will have strong interactions with the silica and non-polar compounds will have weak interactions with the silica. Thus, they travel at different distances. The distance the solvent goes up the TLC plate is called the solvent front. You do not want the solvent front to go all the way up the TLC plate. Once you stop your solvent front, you need to draw a line where the solvent reaches. This is because we need to get a value called the RF value. The RF value is the distance traveled by sample divided by distance traveled by solvent. Measuring from the baseline, you measure how far the sample went up and then how far the solvent went up and you divide them. And because each compound should have a unique RF value, they can be used to identify compounds. And under the same conditions in TLC, generally large RF values are less polar compounds and small RF values are generally more polar compounds. Now, talking about the mobile phase again, it's actually pretty important. Number one, your mobile phase can't be too polar or too nonpolar. And this is actually where RF values come in. The RF values cannot be one or zero. If the RF value is zero, you have to increase your solvent polarity because the sample won't move and it's sticking to the stationary phase. If the value is one, you need to decrease your solvent polarity because the compound is not separating correctly. We also need to make sure that the mobile phase is compatible with the stationary phase and nothing reacts. And that you found the right mobile phase formulation so you can actually separate your compounds. And lastly, you do need to take consideration if your mobile phase is volatile or not. Sometimes if the mobile phase is not as volatile, it can react with the stains and skew some of your results. But it could also be put in a vacuum chamber and generally fix the problem. 
Here's an actual demonstration of TLC, and you can see the spots separating based on their polarities. UV light is generally shined, so you can see the spot separation, as you normally wouldn't see this with your naked eye. You can also see multiple different spots in the same lane. You'll normally see this when you have a solution with different compounds in it. You can then reference this with different standards that you put on your TLC plate. And since everything is under the same conditions, you can then see if that's the compound that you have or not. You can also use this if you want to see impurities in your sample or if you want to monitor a reaction. Now we're going to go on to column chromatography as we now have a basis on TLC and it can actually be quite similar to column chromatography. The only difference is this is mainly used as a purification step rather than an analytical. This is because we can separate compounds based on their polarity just like TLC. And just like TLC, it primarily uses silica gel and a mobile phase solvent. The main difference is that we're actually going to collect the mobile phase. Just like in TLC, the more polar compound will have stronger interactions with the silica gel and won't travel as fast down the column. The less polar compound will travel faster through the column and you can collect that first. However, when do we know when to stop? Sometimes you'll get lucky and you can see colors in a column, but other times you can't see colors at all. So what we have to do is take a bunch of fractions and then test on TLC plates to see where our compound is. Generally, you would take less than 10 milliliters of your mobile phase, or it's also called the elutant. Now, sometimes your compound might be really strongly attracted to the silica gel, and you might have to increase the polarity of your solvent to get it out of the column. Essentially, the polar solvent will actually compete for space on the silica gel with the polar compound. It basically just beats the shit out of it. Since this space is temporarily occupied by the polar solvent molecule, it essentially keeps that compound in solution longer, allowing it to loot through the column. Now that we have our fractions, we can separate these based on where our compounds are. And to do that, we would perform TLC and see where our compounds separate and use those fractions. Let's say we found compound A, the more polar one, to be in fractions 4 through 6, and our less polar one, B, in fractions one through three. We could then separate these fractions, and now we've separated compound A from compound B. Once separated, we would then remove the solvent, and we have our compounds. Having a standard that you could put on the same TLC plate is also a very good idea, though you don't always need it. Now, let's talk about ion exchange chromatography. This is generally used for protein purification. And it's normally performed in 100% water, one, because it doesn't denature the protein, and two, it doesn't unfold the protein. Just a really quick lesson, protein folding is the process where proteins achieve their functional states through interactions like hydrophobic effects and hydrogen bonds. And this precise folding is really crucial for protein function, and errors can actually lead to disease. So using ion chromatography, it's pretty important that we don't unfold it or denature it. Let's also get a definition out the way. Amphoteric means a compound can act as a base and an acid. And amino acids are amphoteric. Depending on the pH, an amino acid can either donate a proton or accept a proton. And there's charges associated with that. And the Zwitter ion is when the charge is zero. We could then take the pK values of one and pK two and divide them by two to get the isoelectric point. The isoelectric point is like a neutral zone for a molecule where it doesn't have an overall charge. It's a specific pH level where the molecule has an equal number of positive and negative parts, making it balanced and neutral. The reason why this is so important to know is because we'll use this in ion exchange chromatography. So, if the pH of the mobile phase was greater than the pI, we would use anion exchange. If the pH of the mobile phase was less than the pI, we would use cation exchange. And ion exchange chromatography has a buffer because it needs to maintain that specific pH throughout the entire separation process. And it definitely is a lot of trial and error to find what pH you need for your mobile phase. Now, let's see a visual of how this actually works. Starting with anion exchange, there's these positively charged beads that are in a column. Now, the beads are positive because there's these chemical groups that are attached to them that are positively charged. As the buffer with the proteins go through, the negatively charged proteins will attach to the positively charged beads. And the positively charged proteins will flow through. Let's say the only protein you're looking for was the positive charged one, well, then you're kind of done. 
But what if we were looking for the negative protein? We now need counter ions of higher ionic strength to get them off of there. Typically, sodium chloride is used as the chloride ion will then attach to the positively charged beads. This outcompetes for the negatively charged protein, and now you have your negatively charged protein separated. This is usually done by a gradient elution where it refers to a smooth transition of salt concentration from low to high in the elution buffer. Now, weakly binding proteins elute first and stronger binding proteins elute last. Basically, the one with the greatest net negative charge will be attracted to the positive charge more and will be the last to elute. And just to be clear, this is for anion exchange. If it was for cation exchange, the greatest net positive charge would elute last. Rather than only a linear elution, there's also something called step elution. And step elutions are generally faster to run and elute the protein in a small overall volume than with gradient elutions. Though this mainly works best when contaminants elute at significantly different salt concentrations than the protein of interest. And if you're curious about cation exchange, it's basically the same thing as anion exchange. Now, this time, we have chemical groups that give a negative charge on the beads. These trap the positively charged proteins, and again, the ones with the greater net positive charge will elute last. And the negatively charged proteins will go through the column quite easily. This is because they're not attracted to the negatively charged beads. Now, when we elute with sodium chloride, the sodium ions will then attach to the negatively charged beads, and the positive charged proteins can now elute through the column. Also, just to mention, you can use other salts besides sodium chloride for different ionic strengths. It doesn't just have to be sodium chloride, but that's a general one people use, and that's the one that people usually learn with. I'm not going to go in depth about the different exchange resins, but I'm going to give you a couple key ideas in it. There are strong exchangers and weak exchangers. Specifically, in anti-exchange resins, the strong exchangers will have a positive charge over a large pH range. Basically, they do not change charge relative to pH, whereas weak exchangers can lose a proton at high pH. And with weak exchangers, you can vary the binding capacity by varying the pH. Cation exchangers are basically the same thing, however, they keep the negative charge over a large pH range. Now, this photo only shows the strong cation resins, which are sulfonic acid groups like sulfopropyl. Though weak cation exchange resins typically feature function groups that are weak acids, such as carboxylic acid groups. These weak exchangers also have varying binding capacities by varying the pH, specifically at low pH, where they are protonated and carry no charge. Now that's just the basics of ion exchange. There's also ion pairing, which I won't get into, but that one's really interesting for organic molecules. I want to stop the video really quick and give a huge shout out to Squarespace for sponsoring my video. Squarespace is an all-in-one website platform for entrepreneurs looking to stand out and succeed online. Squarespace is a leader in website design and they have award-winning web designs. And you can get started with one of their professional website templates and then customize it how you want. I mean, they have blogging tools, built-in SEO tools, and analytics to give insights on your business. And with their Fluid Engine, you can just drag and drop and you can have any amount of creativity that you want. Squarespace just makes it easy for me. If you want all of this and more, head over to squarespace.com slash chemdelic to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain using code chemdelic. Now, let's go on to affinity chromatography. Now, you can think of affinity chromatography like a game of molecular matchmaking. This technique leverages specific interactions between a target molecule and a ligand immobilized on a stationary phase to purify or analyze biological molecules from a mixture. Now, as the sample mixture flows through the column, only the molecules with a strong affinity for the ligand are retained, while the rest of the sample components are washed out. Then the bound molecules can be eluded from the column by changing the conditions, and that could be the pH, the ionic strength, or introducing a competitive ligand. This will disrupt the ligand target interaction, allowing for the selective collection of the targeted molecule. Let's go, we got our purified protein. A business major can't even comprehend the joy that I just got. I also wanted to show an example of common elution buffer systems for protein affinity purification. Now these conditions apply primarily to protein to protein binding interactions, such as between an antibody and its peptide antigen, 
Elution buffers for binding interactions between other kinds of molecules may be different though. I just wanted to give you an example of the type of buffer systems that they have to use. It's definitely not as easy as it seems, and there's a lot of trial and error to figure out what's the best buffer. I also want to say, it is pretty common to use sodium chloride or a gradient of increasing sodium chloride concentration in the eluent to disrupt the non-covalent interactions between the target molecule and the ligand. Now, affinity chromatography is pretty wildly used in biochemistry and biotechnology for purifying proteins, nucleic acids, and other biomolecules, and for even studying biomolecular interactions. Now, we're going to talk about size exclusion chromatography. Size exclusion chromatography, also known as gel filtration chromatography, is a technique used to separate molecules based on their size and shape. They pack a column with these porous beads, and these beads have pores of specific size that allow small molecules to enter while large molecules are excluded and can't enter the pore. Size exclusion is pretty common for protein purification, so we're going to go over that. Now, I want to make things clear. There is no adsorption to the beads and the pores do have an exclusion limit. So, if the protein's diameter is greater than the pore size, then the protein is excluded from the pore. An aqueous buffer is used so it can keep the native protein state. We don't want it to unfold the protein or denature it. As the sample moves through the column with the flow rate of the mobile phase, molecules are separated based on their size. The larger molecules or proteins can't enter the pores of the beads and therefore travel along the path of least resistance, which moves faster through the column and elutes first. In contrast, the smaller molecules can enter into the pores, and this detour through the pores means that the smaller molecules have a longer path and takes more time to pass through the column, eluting later than the larger molecules. Now, I actually want to show a chromatogram of a standard mixture that I did in one of my labs. Gamma globulin had a retention time of about 5.32 minutes and a molecular weight of about 155 through 160 kilodaltons. Cytochrome C, on the other hand, had a retention time of 7.09 minutes and a molecular weight of 12 kilodaltons. This is a good example of the larger molecular weight and or size coming first and the smaller molecular weight or size coming last. Now, size exclusion can determine molecular weight However, it's not absolute or it may not exactly be true. It's more of an estimation rather than an absolute value. You actually have to make a calibration curve and then you can use that to estimate a unknown molecular weight. There is a calibration curve made for the standard mixture. We can then plug in our Y value, which would be the time, and we can solve for X to get the log of our molecular weight. We can then just do some basic calculations and transform the log MW to just the molecular weight. I just wanted to show you this so you can actually see how some of the data is collected. And there's a lot of chromatography techniques that you have machines do it for you and it spits out chromatograms and a lot of other information. And it would either be used for purification or analytical purposes. Let's go on to high performance liquid chromatography now. Now, HPLC and traditional column chromatography are both techniques used to separate the components of a mixture based on their physical or chemical properties. However, they differ significantly in terms of efficiency, resolution, speed, and operational complexity. And actually, column chromatography at home really isn't that expensive. You can buy a column directly on Amazon, and it's really not that expensive, and you can get them even cheaper than this. I mean, how much more can HPLC cost? They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine. Okay, dog, that is actually wild how expensive that is. This better be able to separate a happy marriage at this cost. Anyway, let's get on to how this works. Here's a diagram of how HPLC works. First, the sample's injected. The sample is then carried through a column by a liquid called the mobile phase, which we've already learned about. The column contains a stationary phase, which is a solid material that interacts differently with the components of a sample. This time, rather than the silica being polar, there's these C18 groups attached to it that makes the silica nonpolar. This is called reverse phase chromatography, which is very common in HPLC. Now, the mobile phase is actually more polar now. It starts with a more polar water-miscible solvent, 
such as a mixture of water and a small percentage of an organic solvent like methanol or acetonitrile. These initial conditions will retain the nonpolar compounds in the stationary phase while the more polar compounds will go through the column. Over the course of the separation, the composition of the mobile phase is gradually changed by increasing the proportion of the nonpolar solvent. This process is called gradient elution. The gradient starts from a high polarity condition and moves towards lower polarity. This means that compounds in the mixture interact with a nonpolar stationary phase based if they're hydrophobic or not. Initially, more polar, less hydrophobic, compounds will elute first. This is because the mobile phase is more polar. As the polarity of the mobile phase decreases, less polar compounds begin to elute. The gradual increase in the organic solvent's proportion ensures that the most hydrophobic compounds eventually elute from the column. The gradient helps in improving the separation of compounds that otherwise might co-elute, and this generally happens under isocratic conditions where the solvent composition remains constant. It essentially allows for the fine-tuning of the separation process, improving the resolution between compounds with similar hydrophobic properties. When looking at a chromatogram in HPLC, there's a couple key points. One is the retention time. Retention time is the time it takes for a particular compound to pass through the chromatography column and reach the detector after being injected into the system. Next is the dead time, which is also known as the void time or the column holdup time. But essentially, it's the time it takes for any unretained compounds to pass through the column and reach the detector. And unretained compounds basically means that it's one that does not interact with the stationary phase at all. This is essentially the time it takes for the mobile phase to travel through the length of the column. The x-axis represents time. This is specifically the amount of time since the sample was injected into the HPLC system. Time is usually measured in minutes. The y-axis is the detector response. The vertical axis shows the response of the detector used in the HPLC system. The response can be thought of as the intensity of the signal that the detector receives when a component of the mixture passes by it. The units of the response can vary depending on the type of detector used. For example, absorbance units for UV detectors and area units for mass spectrums. Each peak on a chromatogram represents a different component of the mixture being separated. The appearance of a peak indicates that a component has eluded out from the column and past the detector. Now, there are peak areas and peak heights. The height or area of a peak is proportional to the quantity of that component in the mixture. A large peak means more of that substance was detected. Peak area is more commonly used for quantitative analysis because it's more accurate than peak height, especially for peaks that are not perfectly symmetrical. Now, the baseline, this is that flat line you see when no components are eluding. It represents the background signal of a detector. A stable baseline is important for accurately identifying and quantifying the peaks. And here's an example chromatogram with the polar compounds coming out first and the nonpolar compounds coming out last. You can see the retention time in the bottom and the absorbance on the y-axis. Now, HPLC has a lot of improvements from column chromatography. One, the HPLC uses packed columns with very small particle sizes for the stationary phase, this provides a much larger surface area for interactions between the stationary phase and the molecules in sample, and this leads to better separation and resolution of the components. Two is high pressure. The system operates under high pressure, which is necessary to push the mobile phase through the densely packed columns. This high pressure allows for faster flow rates and shorter analysis times. HPLC also has really sophisticated detectors that are highly sensitive. These detectors can operate on various principles, including UV-Vis, fluorescence, and mass spec, among others, making HPLC very powerful in analyzing a wide range of substances. Since HPLC has high control over operational parameters, such as temperature, flow rate, and solvent composition, it's very precise and reproducible. It's also just really versatile, as HPLC can be used with a wide variety of stationary and mobile phases. It can basically detect most compounds, including those that are volatile, thermally unstable, or very large. HPLC is pretty cracked, however, there is an even better one, and that's called ultra-pressure liquid chromatography. UPLC is literally him. 
However, I'm not going to go over that one in this video. Now we're going to go on to the last one, which is gas chromatography mass spec. The only reason I say mass spec is I can't pronounce spectro spectromity, spectromach, spectromity. I, I literally cannot pronounce that. I have a little bit of a speech impediment on certain words. Now, GCMS is a powerful analytical technique that combines the separation capabilities of gas chromatography with the identification and quantification abilities of mass spec. And it's wildly used for detecting and analyzing compounds that can be vaporized without decomposition. How it works is pretty simple, even if the diagram looks pretty complicated. First, a small volume of the sample is injected into the gas chromatography inlet, where it's immediately vaporized. There's a mobile phase, which is a carrier gas, and this vaporized sample is carried through the column by this inert gas. And that could be like helium, nitrogen, argon, really just anything that's an inert gas. Now, the column is housed in an oven whose temperature can be precisely controlled. Now, the stationary phase is actually a liquid. Now, solids can be used, but it's generally more preferred to use the gas liquid chromatography as it's more modern and people usually just use it. Plus, the separation and resolution are generally more higher in it as well. Also, there's a lot of different stationary phases for the gas liquid chromatography. And that's going to be dependent on their polarities, temperature limit, and representative applications. Though common types of liquid stationary phases for nonpolar would be like dimethyl polysilosanes, and for the polar phases, that could be like polyethylene glycol and cyanopropylphenol polyxylosane. Anyway, as the temperature of the column oven is gradually increased, compounds in the sample separate based on their boiling points and affinity for the stationary phase. Compounds that are less interactive with the stationary phase or have lower boiling points elute first. And then, as each compound exits the GC column, it enters the mass spectrometer, where it's ionized, which basically just means it's converted into ions, by an electron beam or other ionization methods. And you can see for the chromatogram of the gas chromatography, it's pretty similar to the HPLC. You have the retention times with the response, with peak heights, peak areas, and all that good stuff. The only difference is now this one is coupled with mass spec. At a specific retention time, if you wanted to figure out what that compound is or the molecular weight, you could use their fingerprint identity at that time. Now, I briefly mentioned it before, but when it enters the mass spec, it's converted into ions. And these ions are then separated based on their mass to charge ratio. Different ions will allow different paths based on their m to z ratio, allowing them to be separated and detached individually. And then these separated ions are detected and a mass spectrum is generated for each compound. The mass spectrum is a unique fingerprint of these ions that correspond to molecular structures of those compounds. This is a mass spectrum actually for one of my classes. I just wanted to show it on here so you can actually see what it looks like. I will be making a video about mass spec and I'll go over how it works and how you can read these graphs. But for now, just think of this as a fingerprint at a specific retention time of the compound. It simply just allows us to see what that compound is. And there is huge databases of these fingerprints and the computer will match that to a specific compound and you can see what you have. And just think of all of this chromatography knowledge that you just got. You basically opened your third eye. I was actually gonna play a really cringy outro, but I don't think I'm gonna do that. <laughs>